Welcome everybody to my podcast, Big Little Small Talk. I'm Megan O'Hara Sullivan and I love to talk, but I also love to listen. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I've got a very special guest here today. I know I always say that, but this time I've got a guy who's got a resume the length of my arm. His name is Kevin Howarth. You might know him as the town crier. You might know him as the DJ at your kid's disco. You might know him as Santa or a French minstrel or any number of things, but He has had such an interesting life and he's joined us here today on Big Little Small Talk. Welcome, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. And I don't like the way he's had such an interesting life. I'm having an interesting life. Is that okay? Well, that's true. And I think think you started with a misspent youth hanging around in pubs. Is that correct, in England? You have done your research. Yes, I was um, working in pubs as a DJ. I was DJing different places. Well, what happened, my mum and dad bought a little hotel in a place called Blackpool which is like, we call it the, the Las Vegas of the North, but it's not, it's probably less. And so we had the hotel and then I was about 17 and I had a friend and the friend said to me, oh, I DJ, do you want to help me? And then I started helping him and in the end, I bought half of his equipment from him, started DJing myself and started doing stuff and working in pubs and clubs and got spotted and then had the big, yes, we want Kevin here. Had, who, who said we want Kevin here? Well, what, what happened, I was in a hotel And then there was two girls there, and these two girls came talking to me and said, oh, we work for a company, we're a couple of dancers and work for this company called Star Dream Entertainment. And they're looking for a DJ because the other DJ's just broken his leg and the summer season is just starting in Blackpool, would you come on? So I said, oh, well, I telephoned this guy and it was so funny because he said, come for an audition. So I went for an audition and this club held 3,000 people. And my equipment was like stuck together with like elastic and <laughs> elastoplast and everything. And so I went in there and I didn't know what the buttons were all for and all this, that and the other. And then I was nervous as anything, which is great to be nervous. So I was nervous and then put the first record on at the wrong speed because in those days it was all vinyl. Remember the old vinyl, which is doing a comeback now. And I put the record at the wrong speed and then did half an hour and I went off and said, thanks for letting me have a go. And I was walking away and the guy said, what do you mean? We think you're great, we'd love you to work for us, and we love your odd socks as well. I said, what do you mean my odd socks? And in my panic, I'd put on a red and a blue sock, and since then I always wear odd socks, so everybody knows the tale of me with my odd socks. It's a, uh, it's an omen, is it, the odd socks? Yeah, that's it, the good luck charm. The good luck charm. <laughs> so how did that lead then from being, you know, Kevin the DJ to UK DJ of the year? Tell me about that. Well, what happened from there, I was working for about another year in this club and then somebody else said would you come and work for us and I went working for somebody down in a place called Cambridge and really loved it in Cambridge and what happened then the manager said oh Kevin I've put your name in for a competition I said what competition he says oh it's the UK DJ of the Year competition so I said oh when is it oh it's on next Wednesday the first round I went oh okay so it turns up the first round and I always wear like outrageous clothes and all these other DJs are there with the dicky bows on and the jackets and everything and I'm wearing all different clothes and I was lucky I won that one and then I went through to the area one and I came won the area one and then went through this, there's over 2,000 DJs in this competition and then the final ended up at the Empire Square in Leicester Square and it, it was funny because DJs they've all got egos and everything <laughs> and I'm there and I've got a clown suit on and all the other DJs have got ruffled shirts on and all really looking very suave and sophisticated and all that. And then they came to the end and when the, the awards were being given out, I'm still there in the clown suit and they're all, everybody's lined up and there's this guy next to me. I always remember him, Dave Silver, if you're listening. And he said third is Steve Sales, second is Gary Jones and first. And he said, oh, Kevin, you just thank me for being the winner. Thank you. And I went, oh, well done, well done. Is Kevin Howarth. Because I wasn't crazy then, you see, I wasn't called crazy then. So I was like, Kevin Howard, and I'm like, what? And he, I went into the middle of the stage and he gave me this this bronze statue with a, somebody holding a record. And I held it and I went, nearly dropped it on the floor because it weighs a ton. I, I went, equipment, I went this, I went that, I went the other. And I thought, the world is my oyster now. What does it take besides the clown suit to be a good DJ? And what era are we talking here? We're talking... This is 80s, late 80s. Yeah. And what, what's a good DJ? Is it the commentary from you, the records that you play, the, the 
timing of them, or what? How does it work? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, what it is, I think DJs. I, I've got so many peer DJs who are fantastic mixers. They will mix a song into another song, and it's seamless. I'm useless. Mine's like a train wreck if I try mixing records. But it's all about entertaining people. When people are out there, and if there's a hundred people there, and they and they want. Frank Sinatra, I'll play Frank Sinatra. If there's 100 people that want Ariana Grande, I'll play Ariana Grande, like I do. School discos, and the school discos are great. I love doing the discos, because the, the kids come up asking for all the new stuff, but then I will slip in old stuff. And um, when I've done schools, teachers say, oh, Kevin, you play some great old stuff, and the kids respond to it and everything. And it's just about looking at the crowd and making sure everybody's happy, that's what mm-hmm. I say. So do people come up and request things of a DJ? Still? Yeah, I always <laughs> love having requests. Funny story, Megan, when I first came here, I didn't know whether I was going to DJ or whatever, but then in the end, I thought, oh, I went to a wedding expo and I started working for a guy, and um, <laughs> he, he, he's doing the, the disc, he says, Kevin, you've got to have an audition. So I said, oh, okay, an audition, All right, great. So I go with him to this wedding, and he sat down, putting a song on, put another song on, and there's nobody dancing. Then he says, do you know how to use equipment? So I said, yeah, yeah, I know how to use equipment. He says, I'll go to the toilet and I'll watch you for a little while. So I said, okay. When he went, Sonny comes up and says, oh, Kevin, uh, oh, not Kevin, I didn't know who I was, says, would you play um, Brown Eyed Girl, Van Morrison? So I said, yeah, of course I will. So I picked the microphone up, and he requests dedications, this is Brown Eyed Girl, this is for Susan over there, the dance floor's full, and that's what it's all about. You don't create, I've had so many silly things happen when I've DJing. I did a wedding at a beautiful place called Gavin Bar Homestead. And it's very, quite posh there, very nice, very nice place, because I've done the tops of the band. And they're all dancing, and the little old lady comes up in the middle of everybody jumping about. She says, excuse me, can you play Bat Out of Hell by Meatloaf? And I'm like, sorry? Is it Bat Out of Hell? I went, yeah, you sure? So I put it on. The floor was packed, because that was their family tune. And you never know, you can't read people's minds. Because it's funny, when we're talking about the weddings, doing, doing nightclubs and pubs and things are okay, are quite good, because people go there to have a good time. Whereas if you do a wedding, you've got his family, you've got her family, or his, her, her family, whatever. And you've also got age difference between zero and 80. And so 50% of the people hate the music you're playing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like... So um, just thinking about all those weddings and that sort of, I'm fascinated by that idea of being UK DJ of the year. And then you were UK personality DJ of the year for two years running, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that world of sort of nightclubs and what was that like? You know, I'm thinking Saturday Night Fever, you know, but that was, I know, Saturday Night Fever's late 70s, your, your late 80s. You know, like sort of that world of celebrity, it just is fascinating to me. Oh, I, I, I've got to say, I just had an amazing time. I mean, there was only one nine o'clock and that was nine o'clock at night because I, I, I was just, I'm a night owl. And we'd finishing clubs at three o'clock. When I went over to Hong Kong, we'd finished the club at four in the morning and then all other DJs would meet at another club and finish there till seven o'clock and then we'd go and all have breakfast together. And then it was like, it was just, it was fast because the amount of people, it's funny, over here in Australia I've got this tall poppy syndrome, the amount of people I've met through the DJing, I could name people and then they got, oh yeah, really, really, really. But that's what, that's how life happened and all this mm-hmm. something. It was just, mm-hmm. I was a guy who was playing the music and like, oh, David Beckham, are you dancing? Are you dancing with your girlfriend, or is that somebody else that you're dancing with? No, the old because I speak as well. Yeah. That's what well, the, that was my other question. Yeah. When you're a DJ, are you meant to be entertaining, or are you meant to fade into the background? Well, the clubs that I worked at, people actually contacted me to work. I worked at this top club in London called Faces, and there all the footballers used to go, and all the cricketers, and all the top people. And then the first night I was there, I was working with another DJ, and I'm like. Doing the mix, and then the manager came, the, the only came up said, Kevin, what are you doing? I said, What do you mean? What? He says, I've employed you to pick the microphone up to say, Is your hair like that or do you come on a motorbike? <laughs> <laughs> it's like things like that, things like that, just to get the crowd going. And oh, I love that color of the shirt, I love this, I love that. But I still know how to play the music because the music is, yeah, paramount because you know your highs and your lows and this, that, and the other. And, 
another funny thing is when I was the DJ of the year, I used to do one hour spots at nightclubs all around the place. Celebrity spots. Yeah, celebrity spots is crazy, Kevin, the UK DJ of the year. So I would say to the DJ, mate, don't play so and so, don't play so and so, don't play so and so. So I'd come on and my set would be like an hour set of all the top tunes. Of the top, the top ones that were current at that time. At the time, right. Of yeah. me mucking about, putting a Michael Jackson mask on, doing the moonwalk. Because I used to do the, I could do the robots and I used to do all the stuff like that. That's probably why my knees are shattered now. <laughs> well, that or playing a lot of football. Now, um, we just want to leave the DJ world just briefly. Now, Oldham, is that where you grew up? <laughs> is Oldham a football team? Sorry, I beg your pardon for being so naive. Well, actually, it's a good question. It is Oldham a football team, but what's happened with Oldham? I was born... It's a place called Boundary Park Hospital, which is 200 metres from the football ground. And my mum and dad, in their wisdom, because within the catchment area near Oldham is Manchester, so they didn't take me to Manchester United or Manchester City, the good teams. They took me to Oldham Athletic, my team, which I've had for life. And for the last oh, 20 years, they've just been doing nothing, 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 nothing. They got relegated out of the league last year. They were going to go into administration... And then what happened, another silly story, we've got a gentleman called Frank Rothwell, and he's called Flat Cat Frank. He'd be a great person for you to talk to. <laughs> 72 years of age, the oldest man to roll the Atlantic. <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> oh, and, and he's a self-made millionaire from like Manchester cabins, doing making cabins and things and all that. And I went to Oldham for my mum's 90th birthday just recently. And I thought... Mum's 90th birthday, what can I do? Because she's always taken me to Oldham. So I telephoned Oldham and said, oh, listen, guys, I'm coming over to Oldham with my daughter and my mum. Is there anything you can do for me? So oh, we have a corporate thing that you can do. So I said, oh, great, you get three-course meal, free drinks, sat, sit in the director's box. Oh, great, how much is that? £50. Pounds. And I went, £50? Pounds. Is that all? Like about $100? Because normally, like, it's a thousand or whatever. And anyway, and they said, the Queen comes free. I said, who's the queen? Oh, my mum. So the mum, so it was just me and Hannah paid. We went there. They had people in their, like, 14th birthday, 18th birthday, 21st birthday, 30th birthday, going up, going up. And we've got a lady here who's on her 90th birthday. So my mum got up, did a little jig. <laughs> and then we went, whoa. Half time comes, we all go back in for a coffee and everything. In walks this flat cap, Frank Rothwell. He says, oh, I've, 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 and he's got a real strong northern, oh, I've been told that there's a, a lady here who's celebrating her 90th birthday. And so, mum, yeah, yeah. So it comes over, we had photographs taken, and Hannah, my daughter, being cheeky, said, my dad's got a bit of a radio show. Could he interview you? So he said, ah, of course he can. I'd see him after the match. So after the match, he's not about, so, oh, it, it doesn't matter, he's too busy, he's too busy. He comes around and said, Kevin, come over here, let's do a, Let's have an interview. So we stood outside in the ground. It's four degrees. <laughs> I'm freezing. And he just tells me his life story. Oh, how interesting. Um, so Flat Cat Frank has now taken Oldham from yeah, he's zero put 12, to hero. Yes, he? put, he's put £12 million pounds into it. He's gone. We were, when he took over, we just got relegated. We played five matches. We are at the bottom of the league, of the non-league place. Took over, he's brought a different manager in. They've changed the things. And he says... His, what he said to me, he says, this season is consolidation. And so, bang, he's come in and we've, well, we're 12th now, so we're finishing 12th or whatever. So next season's when the new man, the manager can get new things in. What a great story. <laughs> what a fan- and I mean, imagine your mum, how thrilled she must have been oh, with that for her 90th birthday celebration. She loved yeah. it. But we also took it out for a high tea <laughs> to the, this posh place, very posh place called the Midland Hotel, like the Ritz Carlton or whatever, right. really flash place. Yeah. And, and we're going there in the in the taxi, went in the taxi, and he says, where are we going? Where are we going? I'm, I'm not telling you, we pulled about, what are we doing outside the Midland? And we had a beautiful afternoon tea, actually, on her birthday. So that was nice. Unbelievable. <laughs> I, I, I find it incredible, A, that she's still alive, that you had 90. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's wonderful, but that you could get over there and pull something like that off, it's incredible. I'll just remind the listeners that you're with me, Megan O'Hara Sullivan, and we're on Big Little Small Talk. Today we're talking to Kevin Howarth, or Crazy Kev, as he's known in another life, mm-hmm. and we're talking about his career. So, Kev, you decide that you're going to leave the shores of England and you're going to travel the world. 
where did you go to and what, how did you end up in Bahrain? Well, what, what happened first was just after I'd won the competition, a, a guy contacted me and said, I'd like to be your agent. So I said, oh, okay, then yeah. So came my agent and a month later, I've still got no work and I'm thinking, what the heck? What the? I guess if I'll go, Kevin, you, is your passport okay? So I said, yeah, yeah, why? He says, you're flying to Iceland. I said, Iceland? He says, yeah, Iceland. So I get on the plane and I'm thinking, oh, Iceland. So I'm on the plane. As I'm coming down the steps of the airplane, all these paparazzi come to the bottom of the stairs, photographers and everything. I think, I've made it. <laughs> they, all, they all walk past me and go to this girl walking down the stairs who was the Miss World, you know, the old beauty competitions and all that. She was the Miss World and she was walking down the stairs. But that was an amazing place, Iceland, because when I went there, it was like nearly 24 hours sunlight. Because the, the, I went to one disco, I did about three discos every night for about four days just doing an hour in each disco. And we're going in like at nine o'clock, doing the first stint, and then about 12 o'clock the next day, coming out at four in the morning, and it's bright sunshine yeah. outside. And, and so from that, I, I, I travel the world DJing here, there, and everywhere. So, Kev, I'm just thinking about this guy who's kind of grown up with very working-class parents, yep. I take yep. it. And yep. when you went to Iceland, was that the first time you'd been overseas? No, I'd been to the, as every English person goes. Just to you know, Spain. Like, Spain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like Aussies go to Bali, we go to Spain. Yeah, I've been to Spain a couple of times or whatever. So, yeah, it, it was just amazing. It was amazing, opening my eyes and, and the world is my oyster. But it was just different. A friend of mine who was third in the DJ of the Year competition, really good friend, Steve Sale is called, he is a businessman. I'm not a businessman. He pushed the, the thing that he came, he was a northern DJ of the year, he was this, it was that, it was that. Got his own business going, he's a multimillionaire now. And then me, I'm just like, I just went from one to another, to another, to another. And everything has always happened for me, mm. luckily. Mm. I'm just interested, and I started to talk about it before, you know, the underbelly or the sort of seedy side of all of that, the drugs and the alcohol. <laughs> and, the, you know, did, did people survive or did you see them go under? Ah, oh, a few people go under. <laughs> I can tell you another story. Have you ever heard of the Brinks map robbery? We had a Brinks map robbery in England in the late 80s or whatever, and lots of gold was stolen and this, that, and the other. I got a phone call, says, oh, we've heard about you, crazy. Can you come and DJ for us on a Tuesday night? And we'll give you this amount of money. I'm like, for a Tuesday night, you're gonna give us? Yeah, we want you to come on. So I went to this place, DJed. I did the first night, there's about four people in. A week later, there's about 10 people in. We let about 20 people in. And on the fourth week, I'm just not enjoying it because I'm driving to it. And yeah, the money was great, but I was just not enjoying it. So end of the night comes and the lady always said, oh, I'll bring your money out in a minute. I'll bring your money out. So I thought, wait, now go to the office and just ask her, say, listen, thanks so much. But walk around. The door was ajar. Humped up the door. And I was like, there was money everywhere on this table. And I'm like... Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, what the heck? And found out later on that was a money laundering nightclub because they'd got the money from the Brinks Mart robbery. But to get some of the money away, they had to pay people to dilute the money. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, my goodness me. I mean, there must have been a fair bit of that sort of brushes oh, with, the yeah. un- with the underworld. So you started to say, we went to Iceland, we went and we. we had this at this stage were you married did you have any children or what no. sort of age were you no i was uh, 25 26 right yeah so uh, yeah the world no. really was your oyster so you <laughs> and, and so tell me about going to bahrain how did you end up in bahrain well what happened with bahrain was i dj'd here there and everywhere and then a friend of mine said kevin will you come and work for me so i said oh but you're in birmingham i am already work in london and i was living in cambridge it's a bit too far. I says, now I'm moving to Hong Kong. So I said, oh, okay. So what's up? Yeah. So I ended up going to Hong Kong. And this was in 96, 97, when they had the handover back to China. And I had a fantastic time. The best night, Megan, is when I DJed on the actual handover night. What happened? I was dressed as Colonel Mad Dog. 
because you could dress as Colonel Mad Dog and you would dress as Colonel Mad Dog, whoever Colonel Mad Dog is. I had all these medals on the thing, I had one of the old pith helmets, all the, the, the old army stuff on and all that. And Rue Britannia, we're playing all these songs, started at six o'clock. We had like song sheets and giving all these song sheets out and we ended up, midnight comes, ladies and gentlemen, we are now China. So we had a British flag. Very naughty what we did. We pulled the British flag down, pulled the Chinese flag up. All the staff changed into Chinese costumes. <laughs> and we just, I played a Chinese song and then went back to the music, but just carried on, carried on, carried on. And I always remember a girl comes up to me, she says, Kevin, can you play the Spice Girls? Tell me I want to be or whatever. I went, I've played that already. Did you, I didn't hear it. I said, I, said, I played it earlier. I said, sure. Listen, we're watching it at six o'clock in the morning. We'd gone 12 hours solidly. So we finished at seven o'clock. The manager owner said, right, let's all finish now. We all finished, got, got all the patrons out. We ended up going to McDonald's across the road and he brought a crate of champagne. <laughs> champagne at McDonald's. It was like the adrenaline of it just kept on going. So then from Hong Kong, the guy who was the manager of the club, club that I worked at went to Dubai. I had a year in Dubai. And then he moved to Bahrain. And I was DJing, which is when everybody, or I tell everybody this, I was DJing in an Irish pub in the Middle East in Bahrain. Mm. It was like, so um, in terms of the um, being a Muslim country and no drinking and all of that, how, was, how did that all go down? Well, Bahrain actually is Arabic for two seas. And in the middle of Bahrain, there's like a bit of fresh water. And Bahrain has been a trading nation before Islam, before Christianity, and ships from the north or whatever have come down and trade things with Bahrain. And, and it's funny when you meet some of the Bahrain, the Bahrainis are very family orientated, beautiful people, and they don't like some of the other Arabic countries because they were like, they classify them like the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> they found oil and there's no tradition or culture to what they have. And, and I loved it. I loved Bahrain. Bahrain was beautiful, mm. and, I, and I met everybody from there. So you were um, you were DJing, and then somehow or other you end up with your own television show. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, this, as my dad once said, I've got the perfect face for radio. So I the radio as well. I'd never done the radio because I was DJing in this Irish pub. Again, somebody came up to me and said, "Oh, they're looking for DJs on Radio Bahrain, the national radio station." I went there, did a a day and then so a DJ's gone away for a holiday, can you do two weeks, I ended up doing two weeks from that. So would you do the breakfast show? So for, oh, that was the hardest I've worked in my life from as DJing till about two o'clock in the morning, sleeping on the settee on the sofa and going straight to the radio station. But people used to say to me, they'd say, Kevin, we hate you on the radio. I said, why? It says, because you're so chirpy and cheerful in the morning. I said, you should see me about 10 o'clock in the morning when it's all worn off. And so I, I did the radio, and then they said, would you do a, a TV show, like hits TV show, doing music and all that. So I, we did the hits TV show, and then we ended up doing, and that was recorded, and then we ended up doing a live show. And the Bahraini cameraman and producers are so funny. I'd have an earpiece, and I'd be looking at the camera and say, Crazy Kevin, camera two. So I'd be moving my head to camera two. Camera four, Kevin. And you could hear them laughing in my head. <laughs> But, oh, keep so them yeah. but it was good fun and like and, um, very friendly. And did your personality uh, translate to te television and to radio? Well, hopefully it did because <laughs> some, somebody said to me, they said, doing the radio, I said, because normally when it's live, everybody put your arms in the air and you can see everybody put their arms in the air. But when you're talking on the radio, you're talking to like, say, the wall and you've got to project yourself as though you're talking to somebody who's six or 60 or whatever. And talking to the wall as a person, and that, that's how it is. I did some crazy things on the radio because I actually got a call from Radio Bahrain three weeks ago. It was their 46th anniversary, and they said, the breakfast show DJ girl there said, Kevin, I've asked people for memories of Radio Bahrain. I've had all these people saying about crazy Kevin. So I said, have you got any things that happened on the studio? I said, well, we had Pancake Tuesday one, one year, 
and I got a friend of mine who's a chef. He brought a Bunsen burner into the studio and a frying pan, and we had pancakes in the studio, and we nearly set the studio alight. Oh, alarms. I was going to say, how did we go with the fire alarms and the workplace health and safety there? But tell me about when you were doing the television and the Asian tsunami happened. What, what uh, did that involve? And that, that was very, very sad, because again, I've got... you. I, I, I hopefully I'm a person of the world because I love meeting people from around the world and, and I've learned a, a bit of um, different languages. I've learned Indian language, I've learned a bit of Filipino language, just to say hello to people, just to get, because I'm not the big white face in the Middle East, because Bahrain's got a million people live there, 500,000 are Asian workers. So, and I'd get into a lift with some Indian lads and I'd just say, hey, que se? And they'd go, oh, que se? Which just means, how are you? And it's just nice to do that. So what happened on the, the fateful morning, I get a phone call, and the radio, the, the news comes out and says, oh, there's been a tsunami. A few people have died. And I'm like, oh, my goodness me. So then end of the news comes, end of the show comes, and then it's multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. And I think, what can we do in Bahrain? What can we do? So I got a good friend who was a Sri Lankan guy, because it happened around Sri Lanka as well, who had all the equipment. So I rings him up. Let's do a disco. Let's do a little disco and find out and try and do something. So then I've got friends, people higher, higher up, like with the five star hotels and all that, rings up a few of the hotels. Is anything, come and have a meeting at the Hilton Hotel. So in this Hilton Hotel, we had about 10 people around the table and they're all quite prominent people. It was like, because there's booze companies there. <laughs> and so the booze company was there. There's a supermarket people or top supermarkets and things and retailers. And I said, I'd love to do a disco and then it just went bigger and bigger and bigger and we ended up getting different bands in and different things and it lasted from well, what, what time was it so we started about like 10 o'clock and it finished at like 12 o'clock at night in this hotel and halfway through it, I thought what else can I do anything else I can do so I said I'll shave my head and I had then in those days my hair was down to past my shoulders and what I did I got on the stage and I said I shaved the head but I got my friend who the hairdresser said, shave half my head. So he shaved half the head. <laughs> so I got half a head of hair. And I kept it like that for a month. When you go into banks and things like that, they look at you and think, oh, there's a skinhead over there. Oh, there's a, what do you call it, over there? Oh, there's a middle-aged man over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so, so funny. Changed. So your intention, obviously, was to raise money. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And how much did you raise in the end? We, made, we raised 100,000 di right. dinars, which is about... Two hundred thousand Aussie dollars or whatever. Yeah. Over, that, over the course of that day, because it, and it, at the end, Megan, we had all these things that people had donated, and I was like, "Oh, we've got this beautiful painting. Yeah, anybody give me five dollars for it? Ten dollars? Twenty dollars? Twenty? Okay, yeah, just to get rid of the things because they're all donated, and it mm. just enveloped in it. And we, what we did, we we went to the because the, over there it's not called the Red Cross; it's the Red Crescent. We went there and we gave it to the. The th and they distribute it to the f three main places, yeah. like in Thailand and in Sri Lanka. And, right. Yeah. And you felt confident that um, this hard-earned money was going to help the people of that region? No. That, no? <laughs> Why? You didn't no. feel confident? It's, I've heard stories from my f Sri Lankan friend, because yes, it went to the Sri Lankan governments, but a lot of it was just shh, put to the side and all this, mm. that and the other, wasn't it? Like, mm. it, if it would have gone to the ground people like hopefully in my heart some of the money went to things like did go to the ground but I've heard there's so many corrupt sadly in this world yeah but it was a pretty stellar effort anyway I'll just remind the listeners that you're with me Megan O'Hara Sullivan and we're on big little small talk and we're doing a lot of talking with a guy called Kevin Howarth who you'll probably know as our town crier but he's that and so much more so Kevin you've raised money for the victims of the Asian victims the sufferers of the Asian tsunami and then you decide to come to Toowoomba what happened the day you moved to Toowoomba well, three days later, it was the floods, wasn't it? Because I, an, another silly story about that was when I was in leaving the place, my, my wife at the time and my daughter left in the November and I was going to leave in the January because I had so much work on. I've got nothing to come to in Australia, no work to come to in Australia, so I thought let's stay there till then. And then ringing them up every day, oh, it's great, it's raining. It's great, it's raining, because we're like, oh, right, great, great, because we don't see rain in the Middle East. 
So anyway, the, they had a going away party for me at the British Embassy. And the British ambassador stands up and all these people there and, and I like tears in my eyes to sort of say, oh, Kevin, thank you for everything you've done, all the different charities that you've worked for and done this, that and the other. And I was like, oh, it says, first of all, Kevin, we want to know, where are you going to? So I stood up and said, thank you to everyone. So I'm, I'm going to Australia. Yeah, we know, whereabouts? I said, Queensland, whereabouts? Brisbane, whereabouts? So I said, Toowoomba. They all went, where the hell is Toowoomba? And then three days later, the floods and everything was worldwide news. I'm getting phone calls left, right, and centre from the Bahrain saying, Kevin, are you okay? Are you okay? And all that because the it's inland just like, what? tsunami. Yes, an so inland you've gone tsunami. From so we've one, gone from one tsunami to another. You brought the tsunami with you. Is that what you're saying? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually, when I left Bahrain, about a month later, they had a bit of an uprising. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm saying this goes crazy. So Kevin's a wait, left. you live left in a way. But can we just back the bus up a bit here, yeah, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. In between being a 25-year-old DJ, <laughs> we're suddenly in Bahrain with a wife and a child. So how did all of that, where and when did all of that happen? Well, that happened actually in Bahrain because uh, Wendy, my ex-wife, was a stewardess. for. She was used to be a professional ballerina and then she gave it up and went working for Westpac, thought, I want to see the world. And when she was like 30, 29, she said, oh, saw the advert for... Uh, Gulf Air, which is a local aircraft carrier, went there and then we met each other and then I actually proposed to her on the radio station <laughs> and, and I, I should have not foretold what was going to come to the future because I gave her a plastic smiley ring and she said, is that all I'm getting? <laughs> but anyway, That's water right. under the bridge. <laughs> water under the bridge. And so, so in total, how long did you live in Bahrain for? Lived in Bahrain for about 11 years. Right, and your daughter was born there. Hannah was born there, and then she was brought up in a, a, a generic school or whatever, nice school, because Wendy used to work was a um, PA for the principal of the school, so put into the school there. She came across here, and then another f- poor thing about Hannah is she loves school. She loves school work and all that, and she she comes home from school one day and says, says "Dad, I said, what's the matter, Hannah? Everybody's taking the Mickey out of the way I talk over here." So I said. I don't know, I answer everything you say, you be all right. In Australia, I <laughs> mate. Why, why come to Toowoomba, Kevin? What, what happened? Well, what, what, what it was, was Wendy's parents, her mum was a little bit sick, so Wendy wanted to be near her parents, so they live in Highfields. Oh. So we came to Toowoomba, and luckily, a few years beforehand, we'd come to Toowoomba, um, Highfields, to look for a house, and we went and bought a house the cheapest house we can find, but we got the house and then uh, we moved into that house. We had to get rid of the pink fluffy carpets first. I don't know, we lived in a house once that had a spiral staircase with purple carpet on the upright and pink on the steps going down and that was and it was um, metal, it had come out of like a block of units and we lived in this old Queenslander and somehow or other they'd stuck it right in the middle of this um, <laughs> of the house. Well that was going to be the first thing that went and when we moved out a few years later it was still there so you know you have, um, your priorities change over time don't they? But tell me then how you end up being the Toowoomba region town crier. What does it even mean? Tell the listeners what it means to be the town crier. To me, the, oh, the, the actual official duties of the town crier is to bring the mayor on or to officiate at ceremonies. Or in the olden days, it was to give news because the town crier back in like the 15th, 14th century in, the, in England was the only person who could read and write. So he would come and read the notice and that's where you get posting the notice from, because he would stick the notice on a tree or the local tavern or pub for people to read. But he was um, accused to get attacked as well for giving, because they'd be giving, giving bad news, like your taxes are going up. Uh, so the town crier was the only person who was educated. Yes. Um, so what, what does it involve, what does it mean when you, um, when you, how did you hear about the job as a town crier? Because we had Ralph Cockle, who yes. was your predecessor. Well. That's one of the things as well why I went for it because I knew Ralph from the little bit of community radio that I did and I've interviewed Ralph and thank goodness he was a lovely gentleman and sadly he died. When he got his cancer I shaved my head as well and and I got to know Ralph. I got him doing a little cry on my show for me and everything and then I came in here, saw the job advertised 
I'm running up the stairs at five past nine in the city hall, and I should have been there at nine o'clock. And, uh, and, uh, and I said to the secretary upstairs, oh, is it Mary? Oh, yeah, through the door there. So I opened up the door, and then, can you all wait outside, please? So I went in outside, so I sat there, and I went in there, and then they said, How, can you do a cry? Can you see what your voice is like? And I did the cry, could you hear me? Yeah, we heard you down Margaret Street. So it was like, it was really good talking to the guys and all that there. But when I started doing it, Everyone was saying, Ralph is this, Ralph is that, Ralph is the other, which is great. But to my, I was like, mm -hmm, am I doing it okay? I did Highfields Cultural Centre and they had a volunteers day. And there, there's about 500 people there. And I brought Paul Antonio on the mayor. And then afterwards we're having tea and scones and then everyone's saying, coming up, oh yeah, we know Ralph, Ralph was this, Ralph was that. And I was like, yeah, I knew Ralph. I got a tap on the shoulder, a little old lady was there. And I'd be forever grateful for what she said. She said, Ralph would be proud. And that just made my heart skip. And it's like the old adage, the king is dead, long live the king, isn't it? And, and that sort of like made me feel a lot better. And then the community, like still, I talk, and thank goodness I knew Ralph. So I can put that in when people say, we, Ralph was it. So I say, oh, well, I knew Ralph, he was a lovely guy. Yeah, so. I bet you've brought your own stamp to it. So <laughs> tell me about the competition you went in and the, the loudness of your voice. Well, what happens, you have three uh, things to say at the start. You say, oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay, which is listen here, in, basically in French type thing, a deliberation of that. And it's judged on that. They have a decibel meter. Somebody sits with a decibel meter like 30, 30 meters away and then they, they've got it holding it and then you do the oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. And then they, they turn it off and then you do your rest of your speech and your, your cry. And then luckily I, I got the, the loudest, got 103 decibels. <laughs> Which is equivalent to what? It's like... Give the listeners a bit of an idea. What's 103 decibels sound like? A continuous chainsaw without your ear muffs on. <laughs> you make yourself deaf. I wonder if you can make yourself deaf. That's what I'm thinking about now. So um, is, is the idea, obviously it is, that you want to have the loudest. As a town crier, you want to be the loudest person. Well, it's not just the loudest, because the loudest, of course, that's why Paul loves me doing things, because it's or, or anybody when I do things, because it shuts people up. And then I introduce whoever's coming on, and then suddenly they're there. People are milling around talking. But it's not the loudest, it's also contents of your cry as well. Because I've got a good friend who's um, the town cry of Warwick, Bob, Bob Townsend, lovely gentleman. The only bad thing about him, he comes from Yorkshire, you see. I come from Lancashire originally, the War of the Roses. But anyway, he is a poet, and his cries fluent, and the poetry and everything, he's so good with those. So people listen out for for those, but when you go to the championships, I cheat a little bit, Angus helps me over here at the town council, and we, we do that, because you've got to do a cry from your hometown and a cry from the town that you're in. And the, la the last one we did, though, we did cries from, we went to this uh, like zoo, and we had to do a cry from the zoo, and we've had all sorts of different things for us to How do. How do you do a cry from the zoo? Oh, we was just talking about- Make it up. Yeah, making it up, doing <laughs> different animals are here and all that. Okay, I want to ask you about this, Kevin. There's so much, so much of interest in your life. I, I don't think one hour is going to, 50 minutes is going to cut it. So, you are the loudest voice in Australia, but are you the sharpest mind in Australia? Tell me about your time on the chaser. <laughs> the chase, not the chaser. Oh, chase, chase. Yes, that's right. Quite slightly different. Well, I love doing quizzes. I've always done quizzes. Now, I've not got no university degree, but I've got the degree of life. And I know all so many st stupid things like the longest river or the brightest star or this, that, the other. And I, I love watching the quiz shows on the TV. So I, I'm watching the chase, like the chase. And it says, contestants, please, can you uh, send off things? So I set off the thing. Next thing, I got a, somebody ringing me up. So, oh, hello, this is so-and-so from the... The chase, can you answer in two minutes as many questions as you can? So I think, wait a minute, let me get my computer out. Let me get it. And so like, who, who's, who's the, the man from the Sherwood Forest? What's the biggest planet in the solar system? What's that? Da, 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 da. And, I, I, oh. and I didn't record it. And I was like, wonder how I got, we'll contact you, we'll get back to you. 
nothing came. Two weeks later, you're successful, you've got through to the next round, please can you send a video of yourself and so we can see what you do and everything. So I thought, right, so I dressed up as a town cry, didn't I? So I got the bell and I went, you chasers, I'm coming after you, come on, try and your luck with Kevin here. Da, 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 da. So I did that. The next thing comes through, yes, you're going to be on the chase. So I was like, oh. So you had to make your own way down to Melbourne because it's a, you don't get paid anything because it's a fee. You win a fee if you win. So if you don't win, you don't win. So I flew down to Melbourne. What was good about that was I met an old friend of mine and he picked me up from the airport and I stayed with him for a couple of days. That so was lovely. But it turns up at the studio at seven o'clock in the morning. And of course, me with my mornings, seven o'clock in the morning, I walk into the studio and there's a girl dressed all in black sat on the settee next to me and says, oh, oh, hello, oh yeah, with the chase, yeah, yeah. Next thing, this youngish guy comes in, oh, I'm with the chase. And then a middle-aged lady comes in, she comes in and dressed. So we're all together. Next thing, the guy comes in, hello, everybody, come through here, we're going to have a cup of coffee, just to get to know everybody. So we didn't know anybody from Adam before you turn up. So then you get to know people. Then another silly thing was when they said, we're going to go through to the costumes see what you're going to wear because he told me to bring three sets of costumes so the girls first all in black and she's a Melbourneian and she, they like wearing black and everything says so, oh yeah we'll just put a silver necklace with it there's a guy there and he's got a pair of jeans and a, and a jacket so oh, yeah that jacket's that, okay that Andy the policy graduate nerd I reckon you could have knocked him off the oh. lead guitarist in a band I reckon you would have had him like crazy I know I know <laughs> and then he he was there and then the lady dressed school teacher dressed nicely and then said, Kevin, what have you got? So I pulled the thing out. So I pulled out and it unzipped. The and clown said, suit? No, no, no. That was the third outfit. The first <laughs> outfit was my, my jacket with a red arm and a green arm and a yellow lapel and a blue lapel and all that. I gave it out. And then I had some salmon pink jeans. And then the girl was so funny because she's a way out like the, the costume the lady. And she goes onto her knees and said, hallelujah, we've got something with colour. <laughs> Someone with colour. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So I didn't get to see the end of it. How did you go then on, um, on the chase? In You'll the have end? to watch the episode. I should have to watch the end. But just tell me this. How many American presidents presided during the Vietnam War? Oh. You said two. The answer was? Was it four? Five, mate. Five, mate. Oh. <laughs> so you you had a bit of a rocky start, and then you just did really, really well in the. Yeah. Well, the, the first bit question I, I got was, which is the longest coast? Which territory is the longest coastline? And you said and it's a standard quiz question. Western Australia, but it's not a territory, is it? It's uh, Northern Territory. That was the trick. It's that was Northern the trick. Territory. It was the Northern Territory. Now I'm on the countdown. I've got um, I've got a limited time, so I'm going to go to my questions, Kev. It's been so lovely to hear your oh, story, you. and as I say, I wish I had more time. But I know you do a lot of weddings. You DJ for the weddings. You say you've got people from four to eighty-four. But what's the one thing that you shouldn't ever say at a wedding? Well, once the best man got up and he said. Um, the wedding is a three ring circus. You start off with the engagement ring, oh. and then you got the wedding ring, then you end up with suffering. Oh. <laughs> My mind went completely somewhere else. I thought he was going to say, you know, something like, I've been with, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, well, all right, let's on, move on to number two. What keeps you up at night, Kev? What keeps me up at night? Well, I, I love watching films and TV and things like that, and. I am still a night owl, and then I get to bed, and then oh, I'm thinking, why have I got up? Why, why, why have I been watching those films? So keeps me up. I just think it's about more an Australian, well, it's expression. What, yeah, what, 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 what do you worry about? I guess. Oh, yeah. is that what it means? Yes. <laughs> ah, well, translation. Just, Bye. Uh, thanks, mate. Uh, worry about uh, probably health more than anything else. It's like because I've had to have a double knee operation after playing football all my life, and then. That was a major operation, and that scared me a little bit when I was in the hospital about that. And then that's it. And just hope mum lives to about 150. And uh, go back to Oldham. Yeah. Here we are, flat cap Freddy. We're back yeah. again. Yeah. What about the last time you looked in the mirror? What was your thoughts? Where's it all gone? <laughs> that's my hair. <laughs> uh, no, looking in the mirror, people just still say to me, says, Kevin, you, you, you look great for your age. So I say, oh, thank you, I'm only 24. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a hard life. <laughs> I've had a hard life. That's right. 
Now, I never really, I've never asked this question of people before, but I think about it all the time and my kids know what it is. But what's the song that you want played at your funeral? Well, there was a band that I used to love when I was growing up and I saw them a few times. They called Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. And their number one hit they play here in Australia is Come Up and Make Me Smile. And it's like a really uplifting tune with Come Up and Make Me Smile. And so that's, that's what I want at my funeral. Okay, we'll note that down. But I don't want, because I did the top ten songs once on my, on my radio show and it was like... I think number one was Stairway to Heaven and then there was like Fire or Going Underground no, by the I, um, I heard it was I Did It My Way. That's the number one song that people have oh, played at their way, funeral. Yeah. Is that what you played on your radio show? The top ten of... Yeah, I did, I did like a countdown. It was a funny countdown thing or whatever. All right, now, Kev, you are a British man. Are you a, a royalist or who is your favourite royal? Favourite royal? This question doesn't have to be a British person, doesn't have to be a living person. Oh, so I can say Muhammad Ali. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, favorite, favorite, my favorite royal probably would would be through all all the bad stuff that he's gone through and this and the other. I still like Harry. <laughs> why, why do you like Harry? He he seems as though he's his own man. Although a lot of people say he's not his own man now that he's uh, met your namesake. <laughs> and so, um, and I think one of the worst things in the world. I just hate the press. The press just twists things round. I wish we'd had a good news day. When you put the, like, yeah, of course I watch the news every day and all that, but it's all doom and gloom all the time. I wish we'd have more good news stories, happy stories. Mm -hmm. Because there is lovely people out there, but there's always, sadly, car crashes or wars or this, that, the other. Mm. I want to be happy. (laughs) Yeah, and I think um, having a media monopoly doesn't help. So if you're being directed by a certain... Um, media outlet there seems to be it gets more and more and more polarized doesn't it but um, yeah yeah so uh, what about Tum royalty in Bahrain was there any royalty there oh yeah I've ripped noses with the royalty I've got quick time to tell you quickly I got a phone call this Indian lady on the call on the phone says could you come and do an eight-year-old's birthday party for us crazy Kevin we'll listen to you on the radio so the Indian lady I th- okay, I'll, I'll do it. Not, not too expensive or whatever. Whereabouts is it? We'll send you directions. Send us directions. Go to the south of the island. South of the island, lots of the royal family live down there. I said, how will I know the place? There'll be balloons on the outside. Drove down to it. There was a ringed wall like castle with about a thousand balloons on it. Go through the gates. Armed guards on the gates. Ferrari, Rolls Royce, Maserati. I walked into this place in front of me. Walt Disney Fairyland Castle. And I got this Sri Lankan friend of mine to put the equipment in and go around the corner and meet him. And he says, Kevin, look at this place. And there's a swimming pool with Roman gods the size of like 20 foot tall with these Roman gods. It was an eight year old's birthday party. The Indian lady was a secretary. There was 10 kids. And it just shows you the way the other half live. It was just opened my eyes. And they said, oh, there's food there, burgers and things like that. And then halfway through the thing, they said, oh, Kevin King said, oh, the food's ready. I said, yeah, the food's there. No, no, the food's around the corner. The food could have fed Ethiopia. They brought this birthday cake round. I said, oh, I said, oh can I take a piece home for my wife and daughter? Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Give me this piece. It wouldn't fit in the fridge. <laughs> so this person was? One of the princesses. Right. Yeah. It was the son of one of the princesses. And it was just, oh, and then the, the three ladies, like they were beautiful people. Don't get me wrong, they're beautiful people. And there was three ladies, all looked the same, with long black hair. And there were one come across, can you play Beyonce? This is when the kids had finished the part. I said, yeah, yeah. The other one come across, can you play this? Then the other lady, who was a more sheepish of them, come across, says, it's my son's birthday today. I said, would you play a song before you finish? So I said, yeah, of course we will, would you? And said, what are you doing for summer, Kevin? I said, well, all I'm working, what are you doing for summer? Now, this is going to blow your mind. She said, we're going to fly across to London to stay in our apartment in St. John's Wood for a week. We're going to our Paris apartment. We're going on a cruise ship around the Mediterranean, then fly to New York and then come back. And I said, can I come in your suitcase? <laughs> That's right. All right, now this is going to be an interesting question. Ooh. I always ask everyone that comes on Big Little Small Talk, What's the song that can't keep you off the dance floor? And you've been on a lot of dance floors. Oh, can't keep me off the dance floor. And so many people ask me, what music do you like, Kevin? And 
and, it, and it's weird because I like I like a bit of um, compositions and things like that, orchestra things. Also, I like a bit of ACDC. Also, a I bit like, of Bad Out of Hell. Yeah, and a bit of Bad Out of Hell. I'll, I'll love every song musically going. I like all sorts. And uh, what would keep me off the, keep me on the dance floor? So, you what about know. the song that would keep other get other people on the dance floor? Like the you know your go to besides Brown Eyed Girl. What would it be? Yeah, Brown Eyed Girl. Abba would it go? But one of the kids, the kids love now. You never believe it. Is Rick Astley going to give you? Never going to give you up. Do you remember that song? Yes, Never I do. Give you up. Yes, it and wasn't that. a good era. I can see his high pants. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Another wedding I was doing, everyone was dancing away when I'd first come to Australia. And there's these two girls, about 15, and I I could see them like, you know, all fed up. And I said, excuse me, yeah, I'll play some good music. I'll, I'll play some new music soon. And they were going, oh, no, have you got Nutbush? Oh, Nutbush. So, of course, Australia... Nutbush is the song you go for, isn't it? All right. Well, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I can't keep up. I'm always going in the wrong direction, whichever one it is. But Leroy might be able to find Nutbush for us and we'll be doing it in our lounge rooms as we listen to this interview. Oh, Crazy you. Kev, you have just been a delight to interview. Thank you so much for your stories and your, your contribution to the community and all of the things that you do. I think uh, what I love, I see you at the, the kids' disco. You know sort of more or less into that than you are when you're doing an official function somewhere so you're giving it your all and I just admire that I really I really do so thank you for being my guest on Big Little Small Talk thank you for having the opportunity to be on there and all the listeners around to one where elder people I just love the community and let's stick together and let's onwards and upwards well said thank you Kip That's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on Big Little Small Talk. I hope you can make the time to join me next week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favourite podcast app.